This is the Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. And welcome back. Dean Obadala Show. We're live here Monday, August 19th. And in studio right now, the one, the only, Jameer Burley, internationally recognized speaker, social justice advocate, a lot of stuff. Guest host on Sirius XM Progress, consultant. She was national deputy millennial vote director at Hillary for America. But she's here right now. Hi, Hello. what's up, y'all? What's going on, my <laughs> friend? How are you? I'm good. I mean, it didn't rain yet, and I got um, an alert that's supposed to rain. This is our life. Like, I it was a got, flash flood yesterday. Th- it did was. You get that? Yeah, I did, but it didn't. We didn't have a flash flood. We yeah. had some rain, yeah. not like that. It went really fast. So, well, I mean, it's the world, right? The world, global warming. We've been mm-hmm. talking the first two hours of the show about what happened today with New York City five years and a month after Eric Gardner was killed. That. Commissioner O'Neill fired him. Now, it's a different administration, a different commissioner now. We had just had Mayor de Blasio on. And I said to him, why wasn't he fired for five years? That's the question everyone wanted to know. And he said that they waited for the DOJ. It was a mistake, but they waited for the DOJ. He said, because, look, the investigation began under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And so he goes, we had every confidence in the world. Then it got turned over to Trump, and they dragged their feet, and then Bill Barr did nothing. But it was only taken up by the Obama administration because New York was not moving fast enough with an investigation. That's really what it was. Like, the federal government didn't automatically come in. It was right. because New York didn't move fast enough. And well, the grand, they didn't indict. The grand yeah. jury in December of 2000, that year of 2014, in Staten Island, which I explained to people, mm-hmm. went 57%, 40% to Trump, 57%. Staten that gives Island. you a sense. Like, it's not New York City. Staten Island's its own world. It's like, uh-huh. there's like Confederate flags. It's not, if you're of color, you don't want to have the grand jury that's going to try to help your family in grand, if he was in Brooklyn or yeah. in Manhattan, I think he would have been indicted because it was grotesque. So, what was your, what's your reaction to the small development today that the cop was fired? What's your reaction to that? I mean, we're happy, but like this guy can go get a job at any other police force around the country and him killing a black guy to some extent almost makes him more qualified. Right. And I mean, it took five years for this to happen. And so much has happened since then. I mean, Eric Garner, daughter who became an activist as a result of this, lost her life to the battle. Like, because it's extreme, the, the emotional and physical labor that a person has to put to do this work um, is overlooked all the time. And so while I think the movement is happy, um, there is no real punishment that is going to happen to this individual long term. And also this, as you mentioned off air, is like this is indicative of much larger systematic problems that is not going to be solved under the Trump administration. And so it's almost required. Yeah, it's going to get worse. It's almost required for mayors like Bill de Blasio to do their job. And when they have the authority to actually hold those folks accountable and not wait five years waiting for Superman to save them, especially in the Trump administration, because it's not going to happen. You're a millennial. We point that out all the time because she's here representing all millennials. I hope my sister's <laughs> listening. I'm young. <laughs> so, no, but what do, as a younger person, as a because I've spoken to many people who clearly are not millennials. I can't mm-hmm. tell their age, but just their voices sound a little older today who are African American. As a millennial, watching this video of Eric Garner, watching an unarmed black man mm-hmm. who's literally selling cigarettes loosely to make a little bit of money off what you buy at a pack, but he's breaking yeah. down his cigarettes. He's completely unarmed, not on drugs, nothing. And the cops come over. He's and I played it earlier. I won't play it again because it's heartbreaking to hear him say, uh, "You know, I can't breathe eleven times." But saying to the cops, "Like, look, why do you always hassling? Like, this is an ongoing thing. This is it was during the broken windows policy mm-hmm. we had in New York, where every minor violation they were sending the cops out to, to go after people. Yeah. And so he dies in front of everyone, unarmed, broad daylight." And no one is charged with a crime. Just that alone. Except the guy who filmed it. Right. The guy who filmed And that's, yeah, the guy who filmed it did go to prison. Yeah. What, what's your reaction as a younger African-American seeing this in our society? I think, so I would say two things. I think when you put it all into context of everything else that is happening in this country, the fact that you can collude with a foreign government and still get a slap on the wrist compared to someone who is selling loose lead cigarettes on a corner of his neighborhood, right? He's not harming anyone. But when you think about the damage that oftentimes is committed by white collar crime, by committed by other populations compared to how African Americans and my, other minorities are treated in their own neighborhoods by police because of broken policy, broken window policy, and like the infrastructure of mass incarceration, it makes you think that the, I mean, there's no reason to trust the justice system. The entire justice system 
is created to incarcerate, to harm, and to punish those who they deem are inherently violent and inherently criminal. Um, and so for one, I think for me, when you put it in the lar larger context, it makes me even more disappointed in the larger structure of our criminal justice system. And then two, the fact that the, the audacity of the police officers to not feel ashamed or even to feel like they were being watched, right? There were people screaming at the police to, to stop. Like there were a, a young man filming the incident happening. And police officers seem to almost be immune to all of those things happening. They almost feel like they're invisible, in, invincible to the point that no one is going to hold them accountable regardless of what they do on or off camera. And we've seen that happen time and time again. You know, in the time of Jim Crow, we've all read the stories where the police would kill black people mm -hmm. and there'd be no penalty for the police. Yeah. Now they wouldn't even get fired, but how much different? How much have we progressed on some level? I can't pretend that it's the same society as during Jim Crow. That would not be fair, I don't think. But because there wouldn't even be this investigation, there maybe the federal federal government would get involved in some high profile yeah. cases like <clears throat> Mississippi burning, the famous case there with the with Cheney and Swar uh, Goodman. Um, but what's the message here? I would almost the, say we regressed. Police, do you think that, I mean, do you really believe as a young African-American woman that the police could just kill you and they would not pay a price for it? Yes. You do? Every single day when I walk out of the house, that is my full belief. And yeah, every every time I walk past and I see an officer talking to someone, I automatically stop and start to film. Like, because that's wow. my, my, my perception of the police is that they're not there to protect us. They're there to cause harm. And it's interesting you mentioned back during the Jim Crow era, I think... What's different now is that America has become so desensitized to seeing these things happen over and over again versus for the first time when um, folks saw what was happening on um, the um, the Selma Bridge, right? When folks were walking across right. Selma Bridge being brutally beaten by protesters and by the police, dogs were sicked on them, water hoses. And I think that opened the consciousness of America versus now I think people are just so used to seeing black bodies, brown bodies being brutally beaten and shot at by the police. Oftentimes folks are wanting, running away from the police being shot in the back, hands up, not, not doing any harm and still being killed by the police. And there's been no accountability. And the problem with the police is that any time we do punish them, it's actually the citizens in that society that are bearing the brunt of that. Like if we sue the city, that's taxpayer dollars. Right. If we fire this individual, he just goes and works for a different department. So it's like, what is the real accountability mechanisms if these officers are able to commit crime while trying to protect? It's it's uh, it, the ironic the ironicness of it is that officers are committing crime while quote unquote trying to pre um, pre prevent or protect. So it's like, how? How can you break the law, but yet you're trying to tell everyone not to? I want to play a clip of Emerald Gardner, one of the Eric Gardner's children. Today, mm -hmm. she was with Reverend Al, talking about forward-looking, like what she wants to see done in terms of policy change. And I'd love to get your reaction. Here's clip number six, please. We can't talk about what happened in the past. We can only talk about what we're going to do moving forward. We will be going for the congressional hearings. We will be trying to reopen the case. We will be going after the rest of the officers involved because it's not over. Justice for New York City means Pantaleo is fired and there's no murdering cop on the police force. So, Commissioner O'Neill, while we appreciate you making your decision, we are definitely still calling for the Eric Gardner law, which will ban the chokehold, which will ban officers being protected by a shield and not held accountable for their actions. Eric Gardner was killed five years ago. It took five years for the officer to be fired. I don't want another Eric Gardner. I will do everything in my power to, to never see another Eric Garner. I don't even want to see another video of a, of a person being choked out because it's, it wasn't supposed to happen to him and it's not supposed to happen. I should not be here standing with my brother fatherless. I should be here with my father. But Pantaleo took that away from me on 717. So yes, he's fired, but the fight is not over. We will continue to fight. And Michael Hardy, who's the executive vice president of NAN, said that the hearings are going to be Gerald Nadler has committed to, the House Judiciary Committee, to do one in New York mm -hmm. on the Eric Garner law. And that there's some support for that. The mayor de Blasio sort of sidestepped the Eric Garner law, but completely supports the... Because when I remember the conversation we were having, I asked him a few things. And he said, "I'm for congressional hearings, definitely. And for more accountability. And he didn't say Eric Garner law is in favor or not. 
and I didn't go back to my, it would be a state law, not a city law in any way, but it would be a state law if they would pass it. When you hear these prescriptions to try to save lives, what do you think well, from your experience? What else has to be done? I think, I think to the point is that we have to, the only point I disagree with is that I do think there is something to be said about reviewing history, right? Because we know that um, the, the the historical context of the police force has led us to where we are today, right? It's no it's it's no one off situation. It's a systematic problem that we face in our society that that recognizes that police force was actually built off slave catchers and like what is the internal mentality that have that have led to generational um, harm and um, the criminalization of black and brown bodies and but I do think um, we need to clean out our, our, our criminal justice system we need to um, arrest officers who are breaking the law we need to hold those accountable who are um, facilitating this type of behavior and are and to some extent encouraging it right to meet the quotas that they have to to, to hold and or to protect um, specific communities over others. Um, so I really appreciate the work that the Eric Garner family continues to kind of elevate because you're right, it's bigger than just one individual who was held accountable. This is a systematic problem. There's other officers that were involved. We also need to ensure that um, this doesn't happen again where young people are being stopped by the police and eventually could lose their life for just selling a Lucy on a corner. The you're the second person tonight to mention slave catchers. Yeah, a caller earlier, and and I have an understanding what that means in mm -hmm. the context. It's not a term. I'm, I'm. It's not a term that gets talked about much. Yeah. Well, so when you say our police force is based, its seeds of its genesis come from slave catchers. Explain that, please. Yeah. So during the early days, well, not the early days, throughout the history of slavery, um, there were slaves who were runaways who left the plantation to seek freedom, um, either through the, the Underground Railroad or through other means. And what was formulated by slave masters and slave owners was to put together a force that would actually go out due to bounties they would put head on um, heads on slaves and like awards and then if you were to catch them you would bring them back and so it was an entire collective group of individuals who were kind of charged with this this mandate to go and find the slaves and bring them back to their master and so through that through the criminalization through the kind of the policing of our communities it was actually the formulation of policing was developed out of that idea and the genesis of that is what we've seen through history is the continue the criminalization of black and brown bodies, continue to think that you have to, um, that they are more likely to commit crime. They're more likely to be, um, to be to more likely to be commit crime, more likely to be violent, and it has shown up in every single interaction that I've seen with the police thus far. There's like, a, and and folks always say that one of the solutions should just be we need to hire more black and brown police officers. Well, that's cute in theory, but those people still have to adhere to a systematic problem and quota and and lifestyle and culture that infiltrates their entire livelihood and also at times um, prevails them to commit crime against people that look like them. Because they start to believe what the system tells them is that black and brown people are more are more violent. That's even though the data says otherwise. Right, that's so interesting. The the fact that people, and I guess the idea that they're they're no longer black or brown, they're blue. Right. That's the yeah. when you become a cop, and and that's what people say. Although I have to be honest, I know some. I was talking to the mayor about it. I know like Muslim Americans are now captains in the NYPD. Mm -hmm. And they're like just guys we knew. Like and now they're cap I mean they've been around for a year. there's over a thousand Muslims in the NYPD. Sharia law is common for Which and, is crazy uh, though cuz they get they get discriminated within the force. I mean yeah, of course they do. I mean that's life. But everybody felt like discriminated against this is how the Yeah, but the even world. when you see police officers who who are held accountable, they're more likely to be people of color. Think if we think about the vast majority in of Minnesota, police officers, yeah. In Minnesota, the Muslim guy who was a mm -hmm. Somali killed the bl the blonde woman, yep. and and he was charged and convicted, I think, as well. He was recently convicted, and and, and and less amount of time than Eric Garner, and that was not caught on. And camera. that was very fast. That's right, and that wasn't caught on camera. And the the circumstances were bizarre. He didn't really have a defense. It was kind of odd, but no one came to his his defense either. Nobody. Now here, the flip side, how unproductive is this? Here is the PBA chairman Patrick Lynch today, who was it? douchebag who I've written about him in the past he's I'll play you a clip no, at no time is a police officer ever wrong Patrick Lynch said today and I'll play the clip but first he said today about this decision by O'Neill 
O'Neill has bowed to anti-police extremists, will wake up tomorrow to discover that the cop haters are still not satisfied, but it'll be too late. And cop haters sound like something Trump would say. And then here he is today, like ranting. Here's clip number seven. And I've written about Lynch before. He's really a jackass. Clip number seven. Number one, we are asking for a no confidence vote in the mayor and the police commissioner of the city of New York. It's absolutely essential that the world know that the New York City Police Department is rudderless and frozen. The leadership has abandoned ship and left our police officers on the street alone, without backing. Without backing. Unbelievable. He reminds me, this is the truth here. This is going to sound horrible. I just have to be honest. My mom would tell me my grandfather from Sicily would talk about the Irish cops were really bad to them. They would beat mm-hmm. them up. Because there was discrimination, folks. There's Italian-Americans are now white. Yeah. When my grandparents came here, they were not. They were immigrants. They were more olive skin than I am. Mm-hmm. They were Catholic when Catholics weren't liked. Even though the Irish were Catholic, too. But the Irish cops would pick, beat up my uncles and my grandfather because mm-hmm. they were Italian. They'd be, This guy sounds like the kind of cop who would be... <laughs> Patrick Lynch sounds like the kind of guy who would have beaten up, except he didn't have an Irish accent. It's the only thing he needed. He had like a Long Island accent. Look, you know, the mayor of the Bosnia was just on and other experts have come on and talked about policing and the idea of neighborhood policing. If mm-hmm. you're going to do that, the system is... What the hallmark of that is good relations between the community that you're policing, mm-hmm. the, the dream of it, the, the best case scenario, good relation between the police and the community. So you don't see them as the enemy. You see them and you work together. Some cops you might not like, but overall you're like, hey, they're there for us. When you have a guy like this defending, just blindly defending a, a cop who kills a man who's unarmed in front of all of us, doesn't this set that back where you're like, I, how, why would you be friends with the cops if you're of color when you, yeah, that's the police chief going to do that. That's the, pe- not the chief. He's the PBA union head. I mean, that is the problem with you. I mean, so I love the unions. I, I think unions are great, but I think there are some, if we're talking about the teachers union, we're talking about the police union, there are some systematic problems that are wrong because they've done some fucked up shit and they've protected people who've done some fucked up shit. Um, but yes, when you have the, the head of the police union, talking about how po- cops can there's nothing that they can do wrong again it sets the type of environment that police officers feel like they can do anything and not be held accountable because they're being told by their he- their boss right a sort of their boss that by all means do it we'll protect you regardless of whether or not you were right or wrong and i think it's extremely disturbing for folks who are just trying to live their lives and not sure if if jaywalking will get them killed Right. If appearing to look suspicious, I just saw a video of a, of a white woman calling the police on this black man who looked at her suspiciously. So it's like, at what point? What is suspicious? Love? <laughs> exactly. I was just like, he was just I like, my what? suspicious radar. I don't know. I have my sabar radar. I don't know how you pronounce it. How do you combine the words in any of it? So it's a hot ass mess, to say the least. And I think that um, all the more reason why. The, po- the all the more reason why we need have to have local government governments speaking out and actually creating the change early on, and when possible, actually holding those folks accountable. He can he that person could have gotten removed, could have gotten fired. I mean, at the very least, he could have gotten fired because he broke the internal rules that chokehold was not allowed. allowed. Right, right. And, That's and the thing. He broke the internal. It was twenty years, and, and the the judge Maldonado did it also said that the cop was dishonest in their Mm -hmm. hearing. Now, she didn't use the term lie under oath, but she said he was being dishonest and very clearly was saying that. So you would say, if you're a police chief, the the guy from the PBA, you could say, look, this guy violated rules and was not honest with the tribunal. We don't want cops like this. Yeah. You have to make, you know, some people the the example of what's a bad cop so the other cops know Mm -hmm. what's right and what's wrong. Instead, he's done the idea that, okay, you can lie, you can violate the rules, you can kill a black man in front of all of us, and guess what? I'm going to still fight for you. That's the message the PBA is sending. That's a dangerous message. Forget anything. It is truly dangerous because it makes the lives of other police officers less safe and Mm -hmm. people in various communities of color less safe. So what he's saying is that if you want to kill a black man in America, come and be a police officer. (laughs) Because I'll protect I'll defend you. Because I'll defend you. And and what's also, in, in the world we live in now where whites, are, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes because we have to, because I'm obsessed with white supremacy that has flourished under Trump. Oh my God, you have all the callers coming in saying no, you're no, a hater. No, no, no. But look, <laughs> you, you hate white people. <laughs> literally, you have, Tucker Carl, Tucker Klansman's back. He, he took he, <laughs> his, his hood is back. He's back on Fox News. He took like a week and a half off. He was taken off air because he said white supremacy 
is a fake. It's a hoax. Literally called it a hoax. Literally called it a hoax, right? He's an idiot. And so tonight he's back on. He's talking about Antifa violence. This is a guy who excuses white supremacist violence who've killed over 75 Americans in the last year and a half. But he talks segment after segment about Antifa. How many Americans have killed, been killed by Antifa? Zero. Do I like, do I agree with their violence? Not at all. But how many have died? Zero. Yet over 70 Americans have been killed by right-wing violence in the last year and a half, including 22 just a week and a half, two weeks ago in El Paso, by a guy spouting garbage that Trump says all the time. Mm-hmm. And they won't talk about it. They're, they're worse than Patrick Lynch because they're spreading the news to... Because I get their email. I wrote an article for CNN. We'll talk about it when we come back. We'll, we'll talk about it when we come back. we got to take a break. Back with more Jameer Burley right after this. The Dean Obidala Show. I think Trump clips that they play on the media should come with a health warning saying that if you watch this, you'll get dumber. Never has somebody said so much stupid in so little time as Donald Trump does. Sirius XM Progress. To the Dean Obidala Show on Sirius XM Progress. And welcome back to Crazy Talk. I'm Dean Obidala. I'm here with Jimmy and Burley. In the commercial break, we're talking about crazy people on the right who I don't even know what to say anymore. This just happened. Okay, first of all, New York Times has a remarkable thing, the 1619 Project. August 20th is the 400th anniversary of the day when the first slaves came to the British colony that in Virginia, which ultimately would become, of course, mm-hmm. the United States of America. And that's a big thing in Virginia. They're going to celebrate. That starts, that's tomorrow. That's the fourth anniversary. And, and, and the New York Times notes, and this is the description that apparently pissed off some on the right. It said, quote, it aims to reframe, this is the New York Times saying, it, this project aims to reframe the country's history, understanding 1690 as our true founding 
and placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story, we tell ourselves about who we are. So Newt Gingrich got so mad, this is what he tweeted. The New York Times 16... This is not even guessing. He put the project in the tweet. The New York Times 1690 project should make its slogan, all the propaganda we want to brainwash you with. It's a repudiation of the original New York Times motto. To call the idea of talking about slavery in an honest terms about what it did to our country, before our country, before our founding, and 15% of these slaves were Muslim, by the way, just want to put it out there, that to say that this is a propaganda to brainwash you, to teach you that the real founding of this nation involved the original sin, as people call it. The uh, crime against humanity is really what we would call it. And he's upset. And I mean, the only brainwashing that I've ever seen happen on a large systematic scale for education has been our education system, where we kept slavery out of the history books, where we didn't talk about the founding fathers in its true light, where we didn't talk about the real history of Christopher Columbus. And we overlooked the traumatic incidents that happened with the Mayflower landing on Plymouth Rock. So it's just bullshit. (laughs) He is a crazy i think i honestly think that people like new gingrich are just looking for an opportunity to get spotlight like they're they're just fucking stupid like he's stupid like he's absolutely stupid because i think i really appreciate the new york times because it's an opportunity to one at a time where there's so much racial division at a time where there's so much uncertainty of what's happening with the world I think this is a great time to look back on how we got here and who helped us to create this nation that everyone claims to love and respect, while also not loving and respect the people who helped to build what we now call home. I mean, you know, there are times that on the left, and I'm guilty, and I try not to be, but I can be, where we suggest someone said something, or you go, you know mm-hmm. that person was real, and sometimes we're right, we know exactly what they're saying. Newt Gingrich literally typed the words, the New York Times 1619 Project should make its slogan all the propaganda we want to brainwash you with. It's literally a historical look back at the 400 years of slavery, and he was that angry, he tweeted about it, and there are people on the right, and I was telling him, I'm like, how do they do this? And this but these are the same people upset that Disney car- cast a black actress to play Ariel in The Little Mermaid. An imaginary character. But, but to them, it's <laughs> This is the great replacement. This is the white genocide in all different ways. Having a black girl play a fictitious mermaid who's not even real. They could be black. They're not real. Who knows? But this is more insidious. This idea that Newt Gingrich is supposed to be an intellectual telling other people on the right who look up to him. We Mm -hmm. laugh at him. They look up to him. They go, that's right. The New York Times want to elevate black people again. That's the same way I've had white people call. Why is it always black lives matter? Why can't... And Rudy Giuliani literally on TV calling it racist because it's Black Lives Matter, literally calling it racist, when all you're trying to do is have a conversation about a history of our nation and a history of a people that have been demonized, imprisoned, used as chattel slaves, and you can't talk about it. No, because it's seen as propaganda, it's seen as um, partisan, um, it's seen as untruth. And the problem that I find with New Gingrich comment is like, Again, he is supposed to be, as you mentioned, an educated man. I don't know if that's to be true. Um, I would love the a fact The really finder. low on the, on the right. I'm not kidding. If you're mediocre, you're, you're a philosopher king. Yeah, is that we're gotten to, we've gotten to the point now where folks are looking to sensationalize very important moments in our history to a point where they w- would rather lie about the truth of it than to allow for America to be able to move to where it should be more culturally inclusive, more welcoming and celebrating um, different people. But they would rather keep us in this moment where there's so much hate. And like people, and the problem is Newt Gingrich might not even realize that what he's saying might be encouraging someone to commit violence, right? Maybe um, providing people that the, the knowledge that what they believe that white people are the best thing that has ever happened to to America since sliced bread um, without any which real context. People <laughs> black people never invented the idea of slicing which it. Which sliced bread right. is actually, white bread is actually bad for you. So that's, right, exactly. just, that's a great metaphor for the United States. Right. So yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm frustrated, but I, I think that um, the vast majority of people online have been extremely welcoming to the conversations sure. that this article, I mean, this, um, this project has spurred. And um, as far as I'm concerned, New Gingrich and people like him are becoming irrelevant. Well, only Fox News elevates them and they continue to, you know, you mentioned like in your, when you were a kid in school, like, did you learn, like, I don't, I was an adult when I learned Thomas Jefferson and about Sally Hemings, the story yeah. about that. That wasn't taught to us in school. No. You know, I'm slightly older than you. I'm like 27. 
right? <laughs> you look great. Right. Sadly, not even close to. It's hard, but it's funny because it's not even close to true. But no, but I mean, I went to law school mm-hmm. and I didn't learn about the fugitive slave clause in the original Constitution, which would be for the the slave catchers to catch the slaves who ran away, enshrined in our original Constitution, saying it's the property of the owner. That was in our Constitution, folks. It wasn't eliminated until after the mm-hmm. Civil War, and so the idea of slave catchers was protected, enshrined, and created in our Constitution. Yeah. And it sounds like a horrific thing, slave catchers. That's where it came from. I didn't learn that in law school in America. Like it, Our own history is kept from us by design. And on some level, I wonder if the brainwashing and propaganda he talks about, are we really brainwashed as kids to have a more glowing view of this country so you believe in the exceptionalism that you're told about as opposed to learning a full scope of what this country is about? Mm-hmm. I still think you can think the country is great, that it's moved forward, but for some reason it seemed like there really is an attempt to brainwash us as younger kids not to show any of the faults of this country and only this glowing myth, to be honest. No, that's so true, and it's interesting you mentioned Sally... um Sally and um, Hemings, Hemings, and Thomas, TJ, and, and, and Thomas Jefferson, because I, when I learned about that story, which was in high school, it was characterized as a very romantic tale. Oh my God, was uh, it really? Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> it was so disgusting. Now that I think about it, and even oh now when God. I hear sometimes when people talk about it, it's in a very. Um, it's almost like as if Sally was in a position to give consent, right? Right, right. Um, which that's we the, know. <laughs> that's why I laugh because it's impossible to give me your property. Exactly. So, yes, I do think that I was always taught. I had this amazing black teacher. I only had one black teacher up until K through 12. But she always reminded us that history is not a clear reflection of time. It is written by those who won the war. Mm-hmm. And so they tell the story they want you to tell. I mean, for for a long time, I think a lot of African-Americans didn't even realize that their history started way before slavery, right? That we we came from a place that had kings and queens, that had uh, um, civilizations, that we weren't all just like walking around butt naked in the forest, like killing animals with stakes. And so I think it is is by design. And it's done intentionally because if you don't know your history, if you don't have anything to reference, um, of course you're going to think that there's no, you can't be better than your predecessors. Of course you're going to think that you're inferior to the other. And so um, I, it, this is probably pissing people off who feel like this questions their own identity and what they, they know to be true about themselves. Well, they want a glowing rose-colored view of America. They, they really do. And yeah. there are people who, who just they strive for that. I don't know why. And We're a great experiment that just isn't working right now. <laughs> Look, there, there are some, look, I think you could be, if you're a right-wing American and you're angry about 1619 Project, you should, first of all, there's something mentally wrong with you. You're a Trump supporter. But secondly, you should look at, take pride in that America's move forward. And we're always perfecting the union. I mean, yeah. we just had the lawyer on from National Action Network who co-founded it. And he's mm-hmm. been around since 1981. And he actually has wow. in his bio... So 1981, trying to perfect the union. That's part 1981? of 1981? He's been involved. <laughs> I thought you Him. said 1901. No, 1901. He's 120. Like, what he's the really hell? old. Somebody needs to let this man no, retire. 1981. <laughs> he co-founded National Action Network mm-hmm. with Reverend Al. And so he has in his bio, I think it's kind of cool. And I read it. And since 1981, trying to perfect the union. Mm. It's always, and President Obama would talk about that all the time. We're trying to perfect this union. It is an experiment. It's yeah. not perfect. There's no country that's perfect that doesn't exist. So you should take pride in the fact that America has moved forward. And on that level, that there's an exceptional quality. And mm-hmm. I am appreciative that he accepted my dad to come here. Where I wonder if he would want to come here if a bigot like Trump was president because yeah. he is the street. It's not the 1619 project that is hurting the reputation of this country. It is people like Donald Trump that are destroying on the world stage. And it's funny, you have a, not funny, that's not the right, you have a tattoo of Africa, right? Mm-hmm. On her wrist, you've got a tattoo, it's a silhouette of Africa. And so you're proud of that. Yeah. And it's in, like, I'm proud of my heritage too, but there are right wing Americans I've talked to who've said, I'll say I'm Arab American, Italian American. Mm-hmm. Like, they're like, you're American American. They've literally said this. Like you have to, you have to be embracing just that you're American, American. We're a hyphenated experience. I, I don't yeah. care. I mean, there was a quote I read about um, Toni Morrison, who said that mm. only white people don't get, don't have to be hyphenated Americans, because <laughs> that's the idea of America. Like everyone else is hyphenated, because the only people who are truly Americans. I guess that was the honest, yeah. my understanding of the quote. I my interpretation mm-hmm. was that white people are the true Americans. Everyone else were hyphenated, because in their view. 
I'm Arab American. You can be proud of who you are. This is the experiment of America. I remember President Obama when he visited a mosque for the first time. It was in his last year, and I was invited, and I went. It was cool. And he gave a speech to us and said, in America, you don't have to choose between being Muslim or American. Mm -hmm. You're Muslim and American here. And don't let anyone ever tell you differently. Like this guy named Trump. We didn't even know he was running then. Like it was 2015 before yeah. the campaign. But So that's the... The that's experiment supposed... of America. Like, I believe in the experiment of America, and I don't know why on the right... But the experiment of America, it. too, was like, was to, for people to come to a place where they feel like they were not being per persecuted, they were not being treated different because of their religious beliefs, and like, the fact that now we've we've transformed hundreds of years later only to be just like the same thing that the founding fathers were escaping from. And so I, I, it makes me think that, again, people also, the reason why they dislike things like um, 1619 is because they also don't know their own history, right? They feel like they're lacking a part of themselves that has, one, been a lie, but two, they feel no connection to no other place beyond the shores of America because we've been so insolent and, like, erasing the history of what actually created this country to be what it is, which is the fact that we are a country of immigrants who chose to come here, slaves who did not choose to come here, and refugees who had no other damn choice. So it's like we are a melting pot that um, we should embrace the fact that people are different and we shouldn't force people to assimilate to a, a culture that is a made up fucking culture. Like America is made up and Whiteness English is made up. But also English is one of the most base, basic bitch <laughs> languages in the world. Like why are you hating on someone speaking Spanish? This is a sure. basic ass language. Like relax. I've only recently used it, learned the term basic bitch by the way. <laughs> did you, and I find what did it you so use amusing. it as? No, no, I don't use it you at all. You have to use it. When you use it you have to tell me in what context you, you use know, it. No, there is someone we know <laughs> oh wait, was it you Nina? Oh my it god! Was Nina. Of How course did you? it was oh, Nina. No. Of course Nina would say basic bitch. <laughs> I'm not even gonna say I'm not gonna they're just I know, laughing. No, I know it was Nina. <laughs> so that's how I learned the expression. <laughs> and nothing they show me a video where uh, there was a funny a comedic video mm -hmm. made about basic bitch. I had no idea what it was. I'm like, oh my god, that's what that means. So it's funny that English is the most basic bitch thing. So, all right. I, I hope I, that makes me take me to Breitbart again. No, because they're listening. not monitoring this. If you're on MS, they would be. Let's take a quick break. If you're on MSNBC, that definitely would write that up. Be right back after this. Progressive values are the best of American values, and we need to keep fighting for them to save our country. Don't go anywhere. This is the Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. Got your results back. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but the test was positive. You're a basic bitch. Got your results back.
You're listening to The Dino Bidala Show, Sirius XM's Progress. And welcome back to Dino Bidala Show. We're here with Jameer and Burley. By the way, Bruce in California made a point. He goes, the same people who demonize Kaepernick for kneeling are, are angry over any discussion. I mean, that's the discussion we had was me. You know Tiffany Cross? Mm-hmm. We were on MS and Jason Johnson, who not the black guy, a white one, which is just sk- <laughs> screwed up everybody. So cause we're like, what happened to Jason? You know? replaced him with a white guy. <laughs> the white guy who got so mad. I mentioned my privilege, and he got so mad. because I grew up in a trailer park and stuff. I was not saying anything. Okay, I did say, because he was giving us his lecture. He's a Republican who hates Trump, right? Mm-hmm. So he was trying to give us a little talk about Stop saying racism so much because you're turning off people in the middle. And he was actually trying to be constructive. I said, with all due respect, I said, when I mention racism, it's not a political calculation. It's personal that my community yeah. is fearful. People of color are, are fearful. There are guys walking into malls and killing people. Mm-hmm. People in my mosque on Friday, they're fearful a guy's going to come in like a synagogue and kill them. So I said, we, yeah. we talk about it because we're afraid. And I said, white privilege, and I didn't say to him because we're not talking about him. I go, white privilege lets people say to us, you don't, don't talk about those issues. I was saying it in it's general. I, I really, I wasn't really talking to him. Well, he took it all personal. And then Tiffany had said, when we're talking about racism, you should defer to people of color or the people of the communities, which I agree with, who are suffering it, mm-hmm. who are suffering. The, like, I was on, talking about Palestine with a woman who was Jewish who was saying something was anti-Semitic. I'm not going to tell her it's not anti-Semitic. You're Jewish. If you think it's anti-Semitic, it's fine. I might quote another Jewish person saying it's not, but I'm not going to sit there and tell yeah. you what is not. Don't tell me. How, um, don't right. tell another person how He got feel. so mad at that. How dare you tell me as a white person not to feel like, to be able to talk about racism? I'm like, no one's saying you can't talk about it. We're saying defer to, so it was a bizarre don't tell somebody fight. to tell them. Don't tell other people of color that what is racism and it is not. They, they, I don't know. I don't know. And say that the the level of it's beyond white privilege. It's white entitlement to say to us, the community of color, Muslim, black, brown, whatever, LGBT community, that when we're complaining about or mm-hmm. talking about being discriminated against or demonized, we know when they're doing it. We're not yeah. saying it for political gain, folks. We're saying it because we're worried about, we know where it leads to when you dehumanize us and discriminate it because yeah, it's, it's discrimination and killing us. <laughs> so this is just, I've never been more beside myself, not with that guy, just that mindset. People are more afraid of being called racist than they are actually in dealing with the races that exist. And that's problematic. Like oh. just saying the word pits them in a bind and i'm just like well what would you call demonizing um muslims coming i mean demonizing muslims coming into this country and like putting a whole ban on muslim countries what would you call um calling all mexicans rapists and murderers and then putting babies in cha- in cages what would you call like all of the, those things are clear examples of him being fucking racist and, and and really and the extreme response was tucker carlson after the shooting el paso mm-hmm. when it was no doubt the man was a white supremacist no yeah. one was calling i called tucker Carlson Tucker Klansman, he is a white supremacist. But no one at that moment was, and he called it literally a hoax. White supremacy was a hoax. I played the clip. That's why he was off air for a week and a half. That was the most bizarre defense I've ever heard. Like the idea that there's no such thing as white supremacy. Mm-hmm. You're an idiot for thinking that. And it is dangerous. It is, And he goes, well, you can put all the white supremacists in one college stadium making light of it. That doesn't mean they're not lethal and dangerous. They've killed Americans. They've... And they kill other white people. That's the crazy thing. It's not they like they're care. just killing people of color. They're killing your nieces, your nephews, your aunts, your uncles in malls and movie theaters and in schools. So it's like at some point. Well, look, well, all right. We get five minutes before the next break. Let me ask you this. So you have to put on your hat. You're going to be okay. black, a millennial, and a woman at different times. You have to. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. So whatever you want to do. Oof. First of all. <laughs> First of all, does does it make you happy that Trump is so mad at Fox? Yesterday he lashed out against Fox News. Their polls show, and I know it's early, but they show their polls show Trump losing handily to Joe Biden, to Bernie Sanders, to Liz Warren, and Kamala Harris. Even the polls aren't accurate. Just the trolling pleasure it brings oh, me to see that it's a Fox News poll. He is so mad. Is it is it just fun for for allow? Oh, for this it's totally- freaking out. It's totally entertaining because also it's like, did you want them to like fudge the numbers and lie? Like, I'm just curious. What did yes, you he expect did. He them really to do? He really thought they were their state media. And 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 for for him who's actually trying to win an election, that's stupid because now you're not getting accurate information for you to be able to strategize and do your job correctly, dummy. Um, so I'm I'm purely entertained. It was just funny seeing him like pissed off at Fox while also calling them we. <laughs> 
like he said it's we at we? one point oh that's very funny i didn't even notice that oh my <laughs> god he was like we and i was just like oh okay so you are fox news good to know <laughs> we are we had meetings so let's talk about the 2020 democratic race this yes. is important here. <clears throat> new polls the average real clear politics average joe biden's at 30 the next closest little liz warren at 17 but an economist poll last week, which the media went crazy for, showed the gap between Biden and Warren at only three points. That's the closest any poll. It's a pretty reputable poll. It's not an A-rated, but it's like a B-rated poll mm-hmm. by 538, so it's reputable. It's showing you see a trend of this gap closing. And it seems the reporting is the Biden team strategy is to keep Biden from the media and do less events. I can't think of a worse thing to do. It's stupid because he's also not rolling out any new plans. Biden is only riding on the coattails of the success of the Obama administration. And it's starting to show when you have people who are having serious conversations about serious policy. And the only time you see Biden is in these small town events or on the debate stage. And I think people are noticing and are getting frustrated. I also think people are forgetting that he's in the race um, (laughs) because he's not showing up and speaking out in a real way. And I think that when you have a candidate like Trump as your opponent, people want to see examples that you can go up against him and actually show that you can be successful in doing it. And Biden just hasn't been able to do that. Um, I also find it interesting that everyone kept saying that like Kamala Warren were not electable, right? We should only elect Biden. I mean, we should only move Biden through the nomination because he's electable. And so many polls have shown that these individuals can win with the full power of the party behind them. They can win. And I think that changes everything. When the more consistent polls show that Liz Warren can win, mm-hmm. Kamala can win, or even Bernie. I mean, then that makes, and I, I'm, not, I'm not sliding Bernie. I'm just saying, like, you've got the four candidates now consistently beating Trump. Yep. It changes the electability argument. It's no longer one person. So Biden's greatest support, especially South Carolina, which is a key early mm-hmm. state, African-Americans. And of that, it skews older. What do you think it would take for for older African Americans to peel away, because they peeled away and went to somebody else, that changes the game. That changes the entire game right now. I think what's going. I think the problem is that older, particularly people of color, older Americans are very nervous and they want to play it safe. Right, and right. Biden looks like that. this very safe candidate who doesn't is not very pro- not too progressive, but also not too conservative. Um, he kind of sits somewhere in the middle because he's quiet and he's by himself. <laughs> um, but I, I'm hoping that the more folks are able to see examples of Kamala and Warren and speaking out and also just seeing other candidates like Castro challenging him. They start to realize that he's not as great and he's not as amazing as their expectations are. And that also we have more options and the options should allow us to ask really hard questions around what is the differentiation around policy? Who can actually beat Trump? And what does a solid ticket of two people actually look like who can move this country beyond just the damage that Trump has enabled, but actually move us to find solutions for real change and to hopefully eliminate white supremacy from America and I wonder it's a that's a great point the idea that for our communities for communities under the gun of Trump that it, it's personal mm-hmm. it's not political so you're gonna pick you all compromise quicker to go with someone you might not line up with if that person can beat Donald Trump to get rid of the fire I mean when the house is on fire as people keep making that analogy yeah. it's hard to think about little things like I just want to put the fire out and who's gonna do that but the more polls that show Liz Warren, mm-hmm. you know, the more... It, She's raising money. I keep waiting for Julian Castro to, to emerge a little bit more. Um, all right, let's take a quick break. We'll come back with more of the Dean Obadala Show. Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127.
Dean Ovidala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. And welcome back to the Nobi Dollar Show. Monday, August 19th, Jamira Burley's here in studio. Jamira, what do you think, my friend? We have like Popeyes. A... <laughs> what did you say, Popeyes? Oh, by the way, tell tell we have 90 seconds. What's the thing with Popeyes? It's trending on Twitter right so now. So Chick Fil A and Popeyes are going head to hand. Who head to head? Who has the best chicken sandwich? So, um, you know, go out and try them. I appreciate it. You know, if we can have any alternative to bigotry and hatred, by all means, continue to eat Popeyes. And no, they're not paying me yet. <laughs> so you think one day they're going to be? You're going to be social media strategists. Where can people, as a social media strategist, where can people follow you on social media? I am on Facebook and Twitter. I mean, Facebook and Instagram. I'm at Jamira Burley. And is Instagram more effective in reaching younger people? I yep. Think. Hit me up on my DMs. Slide into the DMs. And and Twitter, <laughs> Twitter's for older people or for more media? It's it's just, you know, just more reactionary. Things live a little bit longer on Instagram versus like things are so reactionary on Twitter. Oh, interesting. All right. Jamira, thank you very much for coming in. I appreciate it. Folks, thanks for tuning in. I had a lot of Good conversations tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. I promise you even more good conversations tomorrow. I'm on Twitter all the time, at Dean Obidala. I'm also on Twi- on Instagram. I don't mention it much, at Dean Obidala. And I don't know where Lauren and Matt are. On. There, follow them too. And Dean at DeanofRadio.com. Drop me an email. Have a great night. Yeah.